Okay, I think we could go ahead and get started. People keep coming in and that's okay. They can watch the recording if they want to hear my intro spiel. Um, welcome to everybody who is here. My name is Liberty and I'm a member of the Firestorm Collective. Uh, tonight, we're excited to host uh, Rattling the Cages editors, Eric King and Josh Davidson, uh, in conversation with Bori and Farhan, two individuals who spent decades imprisoned in New York where they became politicized as they fought for their freedom. Um, please note that tonight we are using uh, Zoom, um, a webinar. So uh, there's an open chat that you're welcome to use. Um, but we do also hope that you'll uh, write out some questions for the panel uh, and put those in the Q&A. It's a little better to put those in the Q&A than the chat so they don't get buried. Um, and go ahead and write them as they come to mind rather than waiting till the very end. It's, it's great to have a, a pool of questions uh, that Eric and crew can, can draw from. Okay, great. So um, let's see, we're gonna go ahead and get started here. Uh, this is actually our last virtual event of 2025, um, but I know uh, both the Rattling the Cage series and Firestorm uh, are kind of continuing in the new year. So I do encourage you to follow us on social media and also bookmark our calendar. I'll drop a link for that in just a minute. Uh, let's see, so tonight, um, just to introduce folks, uh, we've got Hector uh, Bori Rodriguez, uh, who's a resilient artist and advocate, um, having spent 27 years incarcerated in New York for felony murder and drug possession, finding freedom when released in February 2023. While in prison, he transformed his trauma into purpose through the Bard Prison Initiative and Rehabilitation Through the Arts where he embraced critical thinking, writing, performance, and visual art. His work vividly reflects his journey, blending memories of childhood with the harsh realities of incarceration. Now a Yale Prison Education Initiative Fellow, uh, Bori continues to develop his art while advocating for educational and creative programs in prison, believing in their transformative power. Thanks so much for being here, Bori. Um, we've also got mm -hmm. Farhan Ahmed. Uh, who's a writer and advocate uh, who spent 20 years incarcerated in New York State, including 18 months in an immigration detention center. During his time in prison, he transformed his emotional trauma into a sense of purpose, um, gaining uh, a GED. He completed a bachelor's degree in social studies through the Bard Prison Initiative as well, um, focusing on the impact of industrial agriculture on climate change. Uh, since his release in August 2024, uh, welcome, <laughs> welcome out. Farhan has uh, been planning a uh, to pursue a master's in public health at Columbia University, a scholarship opportunity offered to him while he was still in prison. Uh, currently, he's working on creating a community-based program that provides both physical and mental health support uh, to folks displaced by climate change, which is awesome. Farhan is also passionate about involving younger generations in decision-making processes to address the ongoing social and ecological crises. Thank you so much for being here with us. You are welcome. Uh, and uh, returning, we've got a uh, collection editor and former political prisoner, Eric King, who's a father, poet, author, and activist. In December, 2023, he was released from the Supermax ADX prison after spending nearly 10 years as a political prisoner for an act of protest over the police murder of Michael Brown in Ferguson, Missouri. He was held in solitary confinement for years and met with violence by guards throughout his incarceration. Eric's published three zines, Battle Tested, Antifa in Prison, and Pacing in My Cell. And his sentencing statement is included in the book, Defiance, Anarchist Statements Before Judge and Jury. Eric now works as a paralegal uh, for the Bread and Roses Legal Center. And Josh Davidson joining us. Uh, Josh is an abolitionist, uh, a member of the Certain Days Freedom for Political Prisoners Calendar Collective, and also part of the Children's Art Project for Political Prisoner Oso Blanco. Uh, Josh edited Rattling the Cages, Oral Histories of North American Political Prisoners uh, that this series is based on and he works in communications with the Zen Education Project, which promotes the teaching of radical people's histories in classrooms and provides free lessons and resources for educators. Um, 
y'all, it's a, a huge pleasure to have you all here. I know this is gonna be a great conversation. Um, and I'm gonna go ahead and pass it off to Eric. Uh, there you go, friend. Hello. <laughs> all right, here we go. Uh, Farhan, Bori, I am super, super excited to talk with you both. I feel really blessed that you agreed to join us. So thank you so much. Um, to get started, there is often a, a stigma in the abolitionist community where they isolate or give more notice to political prisoners as opposed to social prisoners, as if there's a different class system. Could you please talk about, um, could you please talk about why, like what circumstances led to you going to prison for this most recent cases? And then also where your political, like where your politics were at at that time when you were locked up? And we can start with you Farhan and then Bori if you just wanna jump in after. Um. First of all, thank you for this opportunity, Eric. It was mm, it's a pleasure to talk to you and be here. Um, I I think uh, to answer your question, is our social uh, setting is uh, allow us or perpetuate us to uh, differentiate us uh, instead of trying to get us together as a solidarity, right? So if we for example, commit a, a certain crime, then it will be categorized as a social issues or maybe other one as a political issue. I think from my perspective, if we can get together and find a commonality among us, and it can help us to uh, build more solidarity. Uh, as for me, uh, it was social issue when I got locked up uh, and I became more aware of at the beginning that my understanding of political environment was very little. Uh, I did not even have a proper uh, high school education. So for me, it was a learning experience from the very beginning. Uh, I made sure I got my GED and got involved with uh, other programs which were being provided by uh, other men who were already doing times before me. So that was my beginning stage to learn more about uh, political understanding at the beginning of my uh, uh, sentencing time. And I will pass it to Hector. Oh, like Farhan, I thank you and Josh for having me Hell yeah. here and um, share a little bit of my story. So what led me to prison was I was selling drugs um, when I was, you know, selling drugs. And one of my friends who also was selling drugs found himself in a complicated situation where the people he got the drugs from uh, kidnapped him for a short period of time and threatened to um, take his life. So at the moment, um, while we was looking for him, uh, we found a person that ran away with his drugs, and then we kidnapped that person, and I <laughs> ended up taking that person's life. Oh, um, so that that was in '95. Governor Pataki was the um, you know, Pataki was the governor in New York State, so he tried to give me the death penalty or life without the possibility of parole. I went to trial. Um, they found me guilty of lesser charges, but I still ended up with 28 years to life. Out of those 28 years to life, I did 27 years in two months. Um, I think since I was in my teens, I was dabbing in and out of politics. Um, but I like to say that it was kind of like a misguided politics. Um, I grew up in Philadelphia from the age of seven to 13. And so I live in a very poor community. And um, like, I was always proud of being Puerto Rican, but with that came not liking white people who we believe put us in, in, in those um, dire circumstances. 
And so I said dabbing in and out because there were times that I would read something about either the macheteros or whatever, things like that. It had to do with Puerto Rico, but I wouldn't really engage in it. Um, in prison, I think that I became more aware of, of the prison industrial complex when I joined Bard College, right? Because then we were, we were engaging material that spoke about different social issues. And, and I had a professor who, she said she was an abolitionist. And that was, I think, the first time that I kind of heard that word. And then I questioned her about it. And then she broke, broke it down to me. And I started um, digging more into it and then understanding how the system was was um how the system was operating and and how for example a lot of big companies like Pepsi and all these companies that their products are in commissary are still contributing to not only bringing diabetes to our poor communities and poor health but also in prison causing more harm with their products in there. And, and on top of that, their products is very expensive. So I just started becoming more aware of that. Um, and, and also like the mental health aspect of it. So yeah, so that's that's how, how I think. I mean, I knew friends in prison who, who would talk to me like five percenters and uh, Muslims and things like that, they would talk to me about the system. But I, I think it was when I was in school that kind of like made, made me, um, brought perspective to the chaos that I was trying to figure out. Will, will you tell people listening what a five percenter is? Uh, a, a five percenter is a, is a, it's kind of a branch of the nation of Islam. They call themselves gods. Um, they believe they are the original people. Um, they have their own norms. Um, I would say that a lot of them are, it's like an off branch of, of also like Muslim. You know, today they call them themselves um, the nation of gods and earth, I think, and earth, something like that. But yeah, they have their own way of, of talking and things like that, but they very militant in, in reading and, and behavior and things like that. Yeah. Um, thank you both. So right now I'd really like to talk about what prison was like before, before your consciousness became politicized, before you started thinking about things in those terms. So Farhan, I'm going to start with you. I would like to hear just like, what, what was your days like? Who did you, who did you hang out with? What were your what was your routine? Um, just things of that nature to help describe, like paint a picture of like what your time was like. So for for me, uh, first few years of prison, it was kind of uh, I would say more stressful for me. So the reason was that uh, I had just recently recently come to United States like three and a half years ago before I got locked up in summer of 2005. So for me, uh, I was trying to, uh, I guess, situate myself with my surroundings, right? Uh, it could be built environment and also about the culture understanding because a lot of things were very new for me. Uh, what everybody's doing, how they are behaving, and how I should be responding uh, or trying to confine myself in a certain structure so I would not be stand out like who does not know what's going on or, or maybe getting in a trouble. So that was like initial um, circumstances for me. So for me, what I did, I was more keeping myself close to elder uh, men. Uh, they seem to be looking for help, helping young men who are getting into too many problems. So obviously when I noticed they were trying to mentor them, I felt that might be a lot easier for me to learn what are the uh, cultural norms in prison setting and how I can navigate accordingly. 
So for me, normal day was at the beginning, I was looking for a job. I, I remember started up as a working in a mess hall at Sing Sing. And there were a couple of elder men who one was actually from Pakistan, other was uh, Muslim uh, from New Jersey. And they got uh, got to like me and they will walk me through like, okay, do not get involved with drugs. Do not gamble. Do not do those things which going to, uh, basically consume you in prison kind of lifestyle, which will be full of troubles and constant and getting into fights. So those were like like normal routine around that time. Lucky for me, within a few months, I ended up getting transferred out of Sing Sing. I went to Five Point, where I started uh, uh, school. So that setting really gave me a little bit more room to breathe. I felt if I can keep myself in educational setting most of the time, I will be learning. And at the same time, I will be staying away from uh, any kind of trouble, which may be easily to get involved. Uh, so yeah, for me, that was initial thing to make sure I'm learning what is going on around me and how I can remove myself from that without getting into a trouble. And sanctuary for me was uh, being in an educational setting. It could be school, it could be vocational programs. So that's where I was spending most of my time in the beginning of my uh, bid. Um, I don't want to make assumptions. Are you, were you practicing Muslim inside prison? Yes, I was. Uh, I was at the beginning, like trying to understand what's going on. Because uh, in prison environment, uh, as you know, each religion has so many sects. So that same thing was when I was in prison, you had many different sects, but a lot of them, they will understand where everybody is and they will be looking for more common thing, how we can relate with each other and learn and help each other. So I was practicing Islam. Uh, when I was in uh, prison, I will look forward to uh, month of Ramadan, which is a fasting month, because that will bring uh, me close to other brothers. And it will be like a way of being in kind of like a prison setting throughout the day, because they will allow us to be together for a larger amount of time during the day and evening. So those kind of different activities really help me to stay focused and don't get involved with uh, negativity. Okay, awesome. Thank you. Um, you are. Yeah. Bori, uh, just in case you don't uh, remember the question, it is, what was your routine like? What was your life like? Who were you hanging out with? What were you doing? Like, how was your time occupied when you were first inside before you became more politicized? Yeah. Um. So as I was saying earlier, when I, when I got arrested, it was five of us and at least three people out of those five were testifying against me. And so I made the conscious decision that I was done with um, with the whole street culture thing. I was like, I'm done with crime. I'm done with all of that. And so when I decided to be done with that, I, um, I just became more involved. Well, when I went after I blew trial that I went upstate, I used to go to the yard a lot and work out. I stood busy working out. What does that mean? Um, up upstate? upstate. Upstate. So, all right. So upstate is when you get arrested, you go to the county jail and then you go back and forth to court until you either blow trial or cop out, plead guilty. And then they send you to the state facility to prison. You go from jail to prison to serve your sentence. And so... While I was in jail fighting my case and all of that, I met a person who gave me a Machiavelli book. Oh. And he told me, this is how you survive prison, right? And so I read the book um, and I read other books. So then when I went upstate, I already had in my mind that I was done with, I was done with anything that had to do with crimes. I'm I'm done with it. Mainly because I had, at least three people testify against me and things like that. And so when I was upstate that I was working out, 
when you go to the yard, there's always problems. Always there's going to be all type of problems in the yard. When I landed at Green Haven, I landed right after a huge riot happened between the whites and the and, 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 and the African Americans in prison. And shortly after me being there, then a big riot broke out between the Latin Kings and, and the Bloods. So there's constantly things going on in the yard, a lot of gang wars and things like that. And so I said, well, you know what? I need to do less yard and more program. So I signed up to take my GED. Um, I joined a class. The, the, the teacher there wasn't teaching anything. So I cheated myself out of that class to go into a class that was really teaching. So I took the GED. And um, from there, I just started taking a lot of programs, programs that I felt would benefit me. At the time, I was becoming a parent. I wanted to be a better parent to my child. I didn't want him to experience half of the things that I experienced while I was incarcerated. So I took parenting courses, um, just a lot of courses that I felt I needed. Writing course, because my writing was very poor. Um, but I also understood prison to be more mental than physical, right? And so I understood prison to be that you, you just have to host a threat. You don't have to be a threat, but you if if people can't read you and they think that you could become a threat, they kind of like leave you alone. But also prison is run on a toxic masculinity level. And by that, I mean, prior to going to the state facility to prison, the same person that gave me the book, he said, listen, when you go upstate, you got to stay away from homosexuality. You have to stay away from gambling. Definitely mind your business. Don't join gangs. Just be yourself and you should be good, right? So I already had that in my mind. I'm reading the book and other books that deal more with psychology and, and just how to really manipulate other people and situations. And I navigated my whole 27 years in two months without having to hurt anyone or anyone having to hurt me. Um, and basically that's, that's how I did my time. I did my time mainly programming, 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 and I hanged out with people that were like-minded. Right. I mean, a lot of people knew me and I would say, you know, what's up to people, regardless of what gang or whatever they were in. But I would not hang out with them. Uh, I would stay to to myself or with people that there was like minded. And I also created a lot of art in between all of that. So art kept me real busy. Yeah. All right. Um. So briefly, I'd like to ask both of you in the feds one of the worst situations we have is the racial element. You can only basically exist with people of your race or your car. Um, so I would like to know, both of you are like, you're different races and everything. Were you able to associate freely with people of different races, people of different religions? Were you able to live with them, eat with them, do fitness? Um, or was it as separated and divided as the feds uh, sadly are? So Farhan? So uh, I think each facility, uh, when it comes to New York State, depending on which facility you are, the rules might be a little bit different or the circumstances, I should say, might be a little bit different. So, for example, in the way the Green Haven facility is set up is even from administration perspective, they, they're breaking, breaking it down kind of similar way, like a racial way, right? So you may have a course which were specifically belongs to white, the other course might be belong to Spanish, and then then you may have, oh, this is a Brooklyn core, this is like different areas. So those kind of things were very common uh, in, in that facility. I think as for, from my experience and my interaction, uh, it did not really uh, confine me in that kind of setting per se too much. One, one of the reasons were like, uh, there were a lot of Muslims who were black. You had a lot of Muslims who were uh, Spanish. They had some Muslims who were white as well. So 
that kind of became like a bridge between other uh, uh, course areas, right? So sometimes they might be hanging out, uh, the Muslims who are white, they might be hanging out with us and they might be hanging out with their uh, racial identity as well, per se, right? So that kind of open door for some of us, like, okay, it's okay to reach out and have conversation with somebody. Uh, but as for me uh, building rapport with everybody, I was very uh, cautioned that I was trying to keep my uh, circle very small, right? And one of the reasons is that smaller the circle you have, less things you need to be worried and concerned. Just like Hector mentioned earlier that uh, you may say hello, hi to somebody, but you may not be hanging around with everybody, right? So for me, when it comes to uh, interaction with other uh, racial identity was kind of not that much difficult, right? Which also plays another role for me to open up door and interact with everybody because one of the things I were doing to keep myself busy was a hobby. So for me it was crochet and knitting. Uh, I learned this while I was in prison. So I will I was making kufis, I was making hats, scarves. So that will kind of open door for me to interact with other people. So I had to be very uh how you say like formal at the same time very cautious not to be too friendly, but at the same time, do open up enough to have a conversation with somebody. So it was kind of easier for me to navigate and observe. I think I was taking a lot of cues from other people, like what I should do, what are the expectations, so I could would not be standing out. So for example, uh, sometimes it was easier. I noticed that if I meet somebody new, he may misread me on assumption that I'm not from this country, I may not know what's going on uh, around me. So they may try to misjudge me, but that was, I, I will interpret that it was not my responsibility to clarify and let them know I'm aware of what's going on. I will just use that in my favor to make sure I'm being neutral, so make sure I won't get myself in trouble. No, that, that makes a lot of sense. Did you ever have non-Muslim cellies? Uh, yes, I, I had. So in Greenhaven, we were forced to be double bunk at least for six to eight months. Uh, but even before when I was at uh, five point, the whole facility is structured as a double bunk. So I, I had Sally's who were not Muslim, but I think the key role was how we were carrying ourselves. As long as we were respecting each other and giving them a space to uh, be themselves, uh, and there was there were less problems. Yeah. All right. Um, Bori, uh, you as well. Like, did you were you able to intermingle racially? Did you ever have non Puerto Rican cellies, or were you able to eat with different races, things like that? Um, I had all type of cellies. Um. I had all type of cellies with all type of religion and, and things like that. When way before Farhan got to New Haven, you when I got to New Haven, you was doing at least eight months double bunk, eight months to a year. You mean so I had all type of, yeah, I had all type of um people in the cell, but prison is very divided. It's divided by race, it's divided by religion, it's divided by boroughs. You name it is division there, right? And so I'm Puerto Rican. When I went to Green Haven, uh, the Puerto Ricans believed that I should hang out with them. But mostly all my friends in the street are Dominicans, right? And I've kind of hang I kind of like identify more with Dominicans than I did with Puerto Ricans. And so there were times that I got into arguments with people who felt that I needed to be with them because I just refused to let anyone tell me how I was going to do my bit. And I'm thankful that it never got to a point, again, that I had to hurt anyone or anyone had to hurt me. But it is very, um, it's very divided. And it all depends on you, right? Because people, they try you. People try you in many different ways. And the moment that you stand for yourself, they, they kind of fall back. 
Um, but yeah, there's is 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 divided, and I have friends from all over. You know, I my thing in prison was I don't want to know why you're in prison. I'm gonna judge you by how you're carrying yourself, right? And your character is gonna tell me whether I should mess with you or not. I never asked anyone whether it was in prison for some crimes. Everybody know why they're in there for, and and you know, obviously you stay away from those things because at the same time you're not trying to draw any negative attention to yourself. You know, if you start hanging around with with like a child molester or something like that. That's that's a jacket that now you also gonna have to wear, and nobody in prison really want to to hang around with that, or nobody in prison want to hang out with somebody who has a reputation of being a rat or anything like that. For most, for the most part, you know, people, for the most part, people understand their situation and they play their roles correctly. But those people that like to run groups, whether they're religious group or gangs, they do like to push the limit and and kind of like bring you into their fold. And sometimes you just gotta like stop them. Were were you in different custody levels in the state? Because you were in for a long time. Did you work your way down, or were you always at yeah. like custody level? No, I worked myself down to a medium from a max A. Okay. And then I came home from a medium facility. So was this like, was the pressure and like the antagonism, was that worse the higher up in custody you were? Or was it just like basically the same throughout? Where people are like trying to like, hey, you should hang out with us or not hang out with them, whatever. So it's, it's kind of different because I went in young. And when I went in young, people wanted you to to be different in their set so Greenhaven it has a big yard and every and in the yard there's different weight courts and so every weight court for the most part is is part of some type of group but you have people that's not part of anything that they consider some new truths and it's cool with everybody that could basically work anywhere right because people just like them they're cool they're not into anything negative and people allow them to work with them. I was one of those persons. Like I could literally went anywhere I wanted it and I would be received and accepted. Um, yeah, but what made it, what gave me a headache was when I went to a medium. Now people wasn't expecting me to be part of a gang, but because they saw me older and they saw my number and they was like, damn, this guy been down for a long time. But I felt that I was going back in time in my bed because in the mediums, you see a lot of gangs where in the max there's gangs and all of that, but people are doing like long sentences that for the most part is more control. The medium is a lot of young people that maybe have not been to a max facility and they're still young. They they just impulsive. So you you me, I felt like I needed to be more aware in the medium that I was in a max. I, I found the medium to be more dangerous than a max facility. That's interesting. Um, yeah, thank you. Uh yeah. so right now I'd like to ask you both about support you had or any connections you had with family or friends when you were first getting into prison first couple of years um were you in touch with your family were did you have friends that were able to support you did you do books through bars like what was it like to have connections with the outside world when you were when you were first locked up for the first like several years um barhan if you'd like to start so for me it was kind of uh I had very less support at the beginning. Uh, most of my family was uh, back in Pakistan. So I was more looking at it like what I can do to support myself. So for example, when I was at, uh, I, when I started off my bid at Sing Sing, uh, there was one uh, older fellow from my country. His name uh, was Khan and he will always look out for me, try to bring some food for me, uh, or try to see whatever uh, basic necess necessity I needed, he will try to help me out. And I will uh, constantly ask him, I said, look, 
instead of trying to help me out, try to help me. I could find some kind of uh, skill which can help me to provide for myself. And that was the opening door for me at the beginning where I learned how to uh, crochet uh, because he had introduced me to another uh, older fellow who knew how to do crochet. So that's what I learned from uh, that person, how to uh, provide for myself. As I move forward for the next couple of years, uh, I will ask around like what's going on, like how I can expand my support circle, right? So I came across with some organization. If you write them, they will send you some books. And I was kind of curious, like they will just give me some books I will write them. And then more I got to learn, I realized they were asking like exactly what you are interested in. And they will uh, send me those in those categories. And that kind of thing made me to uh, look at that place as a exploration, like what other opportunities are there for me, right? And after about three years into my bid, I ended up in Green Haven and I realized there were a lot of programs, volunteer programs, which were being run by different organizations. And I began to sign up for those uh, programs. And through those programs, I will meet more uh, friends who were doing a similar kind of way to help themselves. So this was my immediate support circle for the first few years. Uh, and that transition changes around 2015 when I got into a bar program and I got into uh, with some other organizations who were willing to help me more, like trying to provide mentorship. But my transition up to that point at the beginning was kind of very uh, limited, uh, at least to say. I, I believe the expansion took place after about eight years of my sentence. Um, with your family, because you said a lot of your family was still in Pakistan, were you able to ever call them or get letters to them? Or was that just like, was it cut off? It was definitely, too. yeah, it was definitely very challenging for me because I will write to my family and the letter will take about um, at least four weeks or five weeks just to get a letter from here to over there. Then it will take that much time just to get it back. Sometime the letter I wrote, uh, I may not get a response of those questions maybe in a couple of months later. Sometimes a letter will get lost in the mail. One time I literally just had an empty envelope. It was ripped. There was no letter inside. And um, the note said, oh, you could write back to the post office to see if they can find the content of the letter. Uh, as for the phone calls, uh, I remember I was allowed to call once a month and the call should not be longer than 20 minutes and I had to pay for that. Uh, on average, that 20 minutes was costing me about 20, uh, 15 to $20. Um, and I will definitely do that. I will try to save money, like when I will make different hats or scarves. Uh, I will try to utilize money in a way that I will have some money in my account so I will be able to make those calls. Yeah. Um. Just last one about that real quick. Were you able to have the phone calls and letters? Were, did they have to be in English? Or were you able to do them in Urdu? So I, the mail, it was, I was writing in in my language, Urdu. The letters I was getting from my family, they were in Urdu. Luckily, they did not give me a problem. They did not try to treat those letters as a oh, countryman because we cannot understand. I'm pretty sure they were making copies because anytime mail is coming in a facility, they will open first. They will... Uh, uh, examine the mail for contraband and everything, and then the mail will come to you. So I was certain that they were making copies of those letters and finding somebody who can translate for them so they will know that I'm not communicating or trying to start something which they will be unaware of that. Yeah. All right, awesome. Thank you. Um, Bori, yeah. so did you, like, did you have support? Did you stay in touch with your community, your family? Did you have pen pals? Like, what was your support system like 
when you were uh when you were first coming in or later on when you were in? Um it, it was a roller coaster. Um when I first got got in, I the sister that I used to live with was very supportive of me, but then she passed away. Uh, I think like three years later she passed away. I was married for seven years, so that was a huge support. And then I got a divorce. And then I started building a relationship with another sister and her kids. And um, then I was also reaching out to different organizations outside. And I built support like that. So I've always had support, but it has been a, a it was a, a roller coaster. Um, towards the end, I managed to build a lot of support. Um, again, reaching out to different organizations. I think art opened the door for more support because I would donate artwork or send it to different competitions or whatever. And that would allow people to write to me and I'll build a relationship with them based on, you know, on whatever, um, whatever they said to me. And I also had pen pals and things like that. So I had, a, I had support. Um, real quick, you said you were married for seven years. Was that someone you knew in the free world or was that someone you met like while inside, like doing a pen pal thing? No, I knew her before I got locked up. I knew her growing up. Her, her brother and I was good friends and stuff like that. So I knew her before I got locked up. Did the prison make it difficult to get married? Me and my wife got married inside. We're still together, thankfully, but they made it incredibly hard. No, in, in, it wasn't difficult for me. Um, and I, I know a lot of people who got married in prison, and I don't think they made it difficult for them. Okay. But there was this one guy, Rodney DeFell. He had a very famous case because he supposedly killed his family. So they made it difficult for him because he had many people writing him from all over the world and stuff like that. So they, they made it difficult for him, but not for me and, and people that I knew. All right. Sweet. Thank you. Um, so yeah. I start transitioning to, uh, to political stuff. So a lot of times something our movement will do, we will paint everyone with the same brush. Like, oh, if you're a politicized prisoner, you must have these ideas, these ideas, you must weave this, you must weave that. Um, and we don't always see people as individuals. We see them as part of a part of a collective, basically. So I'd like to know, like, with both of you, what did your politicization look like? What did it change in you? What did it? What were you reading? What did it motivate in you? What did it inspire in you? Um, and what what did that look like? Like for me, it's radical anarchism, um, no hierarchical structures. So I'd like to know, like, what that was like for you inside as you became more and more aware and how it affected you. So Farhan, if you if you could start, please. So uh, for me, uh, I would start off that, that kind of process began for me around, I would say around 2014, around that time. Uh, I had finished my GED in 2008 when I was at Five Point. And I had moved off from uh, that facility and I was in Green Haven and I was reading like different books here and there to a library, but I was not really engaging too much because I had mentally um, told myself that, oh, English is not my language. I really can't learn anymore. And this is it. I just keep doing small things to keep myself busy. Uh, however, around that time, I was working in one of the programs uh, where you facilitate classes, like you teaching anger management program or like prison workshop. Teaching. Yeah, teaching other other men over there. And while I was facilitating those classes, there was one volunteer who was coming in for bar uh, BPI, which is bar prison initiative program. She was a volunteer for them. At the same time, she had some. Uh, clearance where she can interact with the facilitators as well. So I had a lot of like uh, group discussions with uh, that volunteer, uh, Michelle, and she really encouraged me to read more books. And that was like a first opening for me, at least trying to expand my uh, horizon, right? So at that moment, I begin to reflect like where I am, what are the circumstances, 
and let's look at a bigger picture because I was constantly being observed and being experienced like I'm from different culture, I'm in a different country and I'm in subculture of that country. So I began to resonate more with uh, colonialism and imperialism. That was the main structure which was really resonating with me because I will constantly question myself if my country got independence about 70 years ago, why we are not on the same level with other countries who have been uh, free or who were never being uh, colonized by another force. So to answer those questions, to me, the imperialism structure was really uh, a focal point. I began to understand why that's happening, why the developed nations were colonizing, getting resources from them. To me, that structure was really making me more political understanding of that. And that played a role a couple of years later when I got into a bar college as well. So more I read that, more I began to see similar structure being played within the United States, like a prison industrial complex, like how on the surface we may say the slavery has been abolished in this country, yet the prison setting, it just reminds the newer form of the slavery, right? Um, we may be saying that, yeah, other countries have gotten their political independence, but they are economically still being controlled by those foreign forces. So those that was the main structure, or you could say, a uh, template for me to begin to examine what was going on around me on a larger scale and on a smaller scale. Were, are there any books that you can remember off the top of your head that had a really hard impact on you? Um, there were a number of books, I would say, um, uh, I, I ended up reading a, a lot of books when I was writing my senior project. One of the books really resonates with me is, uh, by Mike Davis is, uh, I can't, I think is a, uh, Victoria or something like, I'm trying to remember the title of it. It's basically a history of, uh, uh, India, like how India could never uh, became uh, a developed nation or why it cannot be a developed nation. So in one sentence, the way Mike Davis in that book defines the history of uh, uh, India, he could say that for the 500 centuries around, 2000, uh, around uh, 1500 to 2000, there was no development. Uh, economically like that was his way of saying that there was nothing happening in reality everything was being extracted and taken to uh, Europe because they were being colonized by Europe and when I'm saying India at that time it was not just simply India it was India and Pakistan because they were a one chunk of uh, area which was being colonized by uh, Europe uh, by British that time so the reason I was interested to learn more because I was trying to understand why that was happening with uh, Pakistan or India. What was the reason behind? And obviously it was uh, colonialism, which in other words is imperialism, which still exists. It just has morphed into something else. Like for example, instead of saying there is no more imperialism, all we gotta do is just look at it, how we are being controlled with technology now, or many different forms of a new control, which is, uh, a representation of imperialism. Yeah, awesome. Thank you, um, Lori. If you could answer the same question about like what did your because you had already had it like in the back burner, kind of like what did your politicization look like? What were you reading? What were you feeling? Um, things of that nature. Yeah, that's that's a very interesting question. Um, I I think that. Um, then yeah, that's interesting, right? Because I started when when I got arrested that, that that I was facing all these things, like the death penalty and all these things, and I decided to like just stop with with the criminal life. I I also made a conscious effort to learn as much as I could about my mother and her upbringing to understand why she made the choices she made and not raising any of the boys only the girls and leaving us behind. And so 
that those questions led me to understanding like patriarchy values and ideologies and understanding that that's you know, that that is, is an offshoot from white supremacist ideas and things like that. So as I'm trying to learn more about my mother and I'm in Bar College and I'm learning all these terms and, and ideas that I didn't know about, I'm also becoming, you could say, radicalized to a certain extent because now the information that I'm getting is helping me connect the dots in my personal life, right? And so books... Like I've read books on Malcolm X. I read books by Marion Kaba. I read books by the Young Lords. But those books did not impact me as much as Plato did. They didn't impact me as much as Mary Wollstonecraft um Vindication of a Woman, Vindication of Rights of a Woman. Um uh yeah, those books, and there's many more, but those books like really changed me as a person and it and it changed my views, right? Because it allowed me, for example, Mary Wollstonecraft, right? One of the things that stood with me was that she was telling men, don't let's not compete with our physical, let's compete with our brain, right? Like educate women and then let's compete at that level. And that that resonated with me because of how difficult my mother had it growing up in Puerto Rico on the a father that was very patriarchal and and I feel mistreated her in so many ways, right? And and Plato, you know, just building this perfect city and the questions that came about in that book and, and the allegory of the cave and all these things, it helped me, at least the allegory of the cave helped me understand how our communities are built and it, as long as you keep putting the same thing in front of us, whether it's through social media, rap videos, all these things, we're going to kind of like buy into that narrative and keep repeating it. And so being in the classroom, then I understood what structural racism was and how all of that is, 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 is designed for us to just stay at a certain level. Don't, not progress and things like that. So my radicalization and, and it's also what influenced my art is is these are the books that was there's another book um by Mindy Fully Love. I think Farhan, you know it, um Uprooted, no Root Shock. Yes. Right. And and how that book impacted me was because by the time I went to a medium, I had 23 years in a max facility, which is very industrial. There's no nature. There's no nothing there. Now I'm being taken away from a max facility. I'm placed in a medium facility where I could look outside. There's cats. There's dogs. There's deer. There's trees. There's mountains. There's the highways. But I felt out of place, right? I felt that I had like a headache for two weeks, right? I felt like I wanted to go back to a max and I... Like, I couldn't understand it, so I related that message to one of my professors, and he told me to read that book, right? And what that book did for me was it explained how communities in poor neighborhoods, people, even though they are living in poor neighborhoods and they don't want to live in those poor neighborhoods, they build communities in those poor neighborhoods. And so when big business come in and, and um, gentrify the neighborhood and, and disperse them all over it, mess them up it messed up the community they have it messed them up in many different ways and that's how i feel uh, um although i hated prison and i hated green haven i knew it i was there for over two decades i knew the system then i was placed at a different system so these are the books that like i feel really impact me not so much malcolm x not so much the young lords and things like that because i grew up kind of like hearing about them but since I was more on a personal uh, uh, journey to to understand why my mother made the choices she made and, and why I was so full of violence, the books that I mentioned was the ones that really impacted me and it, it, it influenced a lot of my artwork with my ecofeminism work and, and even prison work. So I'm going to stay with you for a second and then I'll, I'll want Farhan to answer the same question. Cause one of the things you brought up, I actually brought up to Josh earlier. Cause I thought it'd be incredibly fascinating to see. Um, 
toxic masculinity in prison is fucking wild. Um, it is the worst of the worst, basically. Every bad instinct that men has gets magnified when we're inside prison and just becomes worse in my mind. And that was really hard for me. That was really hard for me to see the way people treated women. Like we basically treated women like they were they were the prisoners and we were the staff, basically. Um, you brought that up as like having a big impact on you, like finding finding out about patriarchy and stuff like that. Can you talk to me about um what shedding toxic masculinity meant to you inside if it meant like if that had to happen and how it affected like how you treat others inside and outside of prison? Well, you you know, whether it doesn't, to me, it doesn't matter the name that you give it. You could give it toxic masculinity. You could give it street culture. You could give it um, machismo, whatever. It's all the same thing. It's all come from the same branch, right? And it all stems from this patriarchal values, right? right? So toxic masculinity shows up differently in so many different ways for people. And so prison have this mentality that the, 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 the prison culture is that the strong survive, right? And by that, sometimes it means that the quicker you are to cut somebody, stab somebody, or do something, then people will stay away from you because you're dangerous and 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 you're you're exercising your 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 manhood or whatever, right? That's like one extreme, right? A different way that the toxic masculinity show up is, let's say I'm not a I'm not the violent type. Right. I'm I'm more smart, but I have a job that pays me more than you, right? And you may have the lowest job and now I'm flexing. I think I'm better than you because I have this job that's that's giving me more money, right? So it shows up differently. Those are two different uh, um sides of, of the spectrum, right? I use toxic masculinity to benefit me, right? Because I knew in prison that all you have to do is post a threat. That's all you have to do, right? Um, but it's not the only thing you have to do because it also depends how you play your cards, right? I was never in a gang. Many people try to like draw me to their gangs, but I, I never did that. I was always with maybe one or two people, not more than that. But I learned that if I don't talk too much, if I don't really reveal too much of myself to you, you don't know me. You can't read me, right? And the moment that I feel you say something out of line, I check you and I check you in a hard way, you're going to be like, oh, hold up. He may be willing to do this and that. So that keeps the, the balance, right? Like once I understood that, I said, okay, prison is more mental than it is physical and that's how i use that i i use the threat the possibility of becoming dangerous to benefit me but it's 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 like a it's it's like juggling balls because you can't be a tough guy in prison there's nobody is super tough in prison because the toughest person in prison could get hurt so it's not about being tough it's about like being smart and, and learning how to think and and work yourself in and out of situations. Um, and that's how it showed up for me, but I've seen it a lot in, in, in where other people, mainly in religion, this is seen in a lot of religion, mainly in Muslims religion, they feel that they could dictate to you who you could talk to and all these things. And, and I've seen all of that, but thanks to the universe or whatever, I never really found myself in a in a dangerous position to, you know, I I I I don't know. Sometimes, to be honest with you, I ask myself, I don't know how I survived twenty seven years without really coming out of character or, or having to hurt anyone or anyone hurting me. And believe me, I I seen I saw myself in many different complicated situations, but for whatever reason. I just, I, I, it, it never hurt me. And I've been in difficult situation with, with a correctional officer, sometimes with prisoners who try to 
impose their ways on me. But it just, for whatever reason, it just worked out for me. I'm glad it did. Um, and thank you. Farhan, um, from your, I don't, I'm not going to pretend to like to know your family background or anything, but when you came to prison, it was a culture shock. As you said, you're learning not just American culture, but now prison culture. Did you find like that there was a version of masculinity within prison that was violent, was gross, was not within your character? Or like did that develop over time to where maybe you started like seeing like, wow, this isn't this isn't how I want to be as a man uh throughout your bit? Or maybe never. I I, I don't want presume I don't want to presume for you either. Uh, uh, thank you. So well, I, I think as uh Hector mentioned earlier, this kind of masculinity exists across the board. Uh I think a lot of cultures, uh, if we even look back, uh masculinity is we can see that thread running through right and including religious settings as well like uh, uh hector mentioned earlier right when i look back at my uh adolescent years when i was in pakistan um i'm the youngest one in my family in my i'm the youngest sibling right everybody uh all my sibling they have gone to school uh they got the ged and even pursue a little bit more education, including my sisters. So as I was growing, I will see that kind of like a, a masculinity thing playing a role. But I think the more educated we were, it was giving us a room how to help, uh, how not to become that person who's really in, enforcing their will on others, right? So right. that kind of example stayed with me. Uh, and in a way, I feel I'm kind of like uh, I'm in the opportunity position where I can see my own culture and I can see another culture, right? So what I start to do as I was being exposed to two different cultures, I will take the good in each and I will try to see which value in each culture which may not be good and I shouldn't apply on my life. So when I will observe some men, the way they are treating uh, women, I will like cringe to myself, like, why would you do that, right? So that was the kind of my uh, understanding of that. Uh, if I will observe some men, they are trying to either tell women what to do and how to do or make them feel like they are above them, I will tell myself, I don't want to be that person. And I will try to do that through my actions. Um, one of the examples I will uh, is that I remember about a few years ago, one of my niece, uh, I'm close to her, so I will talk to her over a phone. And I know sometimes we, uh, we hear that arranged marriages are very common in a lot of cultures, which is still common in, to some extent in Pakistani culture as well, in, in uh, Muslim culture as well. Uh, however, at, when it comes to my household or my with my sisters, this notion is not as uh, strong as some may have observed or heard from in other cultures, right? So my niece was saying that uh, there is a opportunity where my family is introducing me to uh, one uh, gentleman, and they think I should get married in that house, and I ask her, I say, if you don't feel comfortable, do you want me to talk to your parents? Uh, or do you want to talk to them by themselves? Let me know. Uh, I'm here to support you. If you feel like it's not comfortable, I will I will support you for that. Uh, I'm using this example to say that she ended up talking to her parents and sure. they understood her perspective. And she did not get married over there. But I was very careful and observant also that the understanding I have of two different cultures, I cannot assume that somebody who's living in another culture will just simply embrace it, right? Uh, I might be more comfortable where I can see uh, that if somebody is talking down to somebody and I could intervene and tell them this is not the right thing to do because I have been exposed to two different cultures. 
I might be supporting my niece, but she's living in the culture where everybody else, like social setting, might challenge her. They might look down at her or they may say, oh, you are defying our norms, right? Because she's only in that culture. So I have to keep that kind of thing in my mind too. And which I believe is very important when we are trying to help her, encourage somebody to change. We want to see what is the uh, context as well. If somebody is still living in the same uh, social setting and we are anticipating them to go against those norms without giving them some kind of support, I think we are setting them uh, on a wrong path. We have to give them the support as well, not just simply tell them, oh, this is wrong, don't do it. So without support, I think the next person will not succeed. And that could apply on uh, task of masculinity. It could apply on many different levels. Can I add something to, to that? Yeah, I think it's also important to 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 single out that women, female officers also encourage toxic masculinity, right? Because the the thing is that sadly a, a lot of us we're brought up in, in 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 thinking that you know like being a man and being dominant is 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 how things should be, right? And so there are times when you have female officers that um don't respect you if if you expressing yourself or if you're not like that macho man, they they don't respect you, they disrespect you, and they put you in very complicated situations, right? And so that's why it's so sad about the the carceral state is that you have to, you don't have to, but is 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 like I you know I went back and forth with one of my mentors about this right I told her that in prison people respect violence and she said no you know people don't respect violence people fear violence right and so it took a while before I could like really agree with her because of just what I saw in prison but the whole patriarchal ideology is like white supremacists right you don't have to be white to to practice that that belief. It's just so embedded in our culture and in us, and it show up so differently that we practice it and think it's normal. You know, it takes, sometimes education takes other people that are more aware than us to help us see how it's showing up in, in our behavior and, and characters and so on and so forth. Yeah, I agree 100% and I appreciate both of you, um, both of you answering that for real. And for, for those watching, like it's important to remember support. Like it's important to remember that this is ingrained in people and ingrained in a lot of cultures and we can help, we can help people. Um, we don't have to just abandon everyone if they, if they say the wrong thing or, um, or make a mistake, we can help build people up. Um, speaking of building people up and this will be a brief one, but did either of you run in like New York state is just fucking filled with political prisoners um or it has been over the last like 20 30 years so did either of you ever run into like some of those people and if so like did that did you have conversations did it help push you along did it have no impact um and either of you can start really um when i went up upstate i had a friend who he was deeply into the law and he told me that he was going to put me down in some into some law classes so that I learned the prison handbook. I learned how to write, mis, you know, because the officer write misbehavior report. He's like, yo, you have to learn how to defend yourself from those things and also how to properly write an officer up and stuff like that. So I, in that sense, you know, I was around people in the beginning that they helped me they gave me the tools I needed to survive that system, right? Um, there are a lot of political prisoners and in, 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 I'm sure it's, it's not only New York State. I'm sure there's, there's everywhere, right? But it, I think it depends how much a person want to put themselves out there, right? Because with with... Being around political prisoners come a lot, a lot of sacrifices. For example, 
if I'm going on my family reunion visit with my wife, right, and I'm hanging out with you and, and all the officers hate you because you're writing them up for every little thing, then now I become a target as well, right? And so now they're going to go in my cell. They're going to put a shank. They're going to do all type of things to set me up so that I don't have that privilege, right? So it's like learning how to fight the system in a way that you minimize how it's going to impact you. Um, but I've met a lot of people. I, I'm still I am in contact with people. The, just their way of thinking and challenging the system, is, is I think it's never going to stop because it's just embedded in them. But I, yeah. I get the sense that they've always been like this, just in prison they have time to sharpen up because now they get to read and, and build among themselves. How did you stop? How did I dodge it? No, how did you meet Josh? Oh, I met Josh because the, the same professor that introduced me to, um, there was a sign called In the Belly. And again, it was prisoners from different um, prisons sweet. just sending in sending in writings and things like that. And she gave me an article saying you should send your artwork to to on um, the calendar that Josh is part of. And so I sent a little character over there. And sadly my little character didn't make it to the calendar, but it came back with a with a lovely note from Danielle. And then we just started corresponding and before you know it, we became great friends. But it started like that. Again, art opened a lot of doors. Me sending yeah. a piece of artwork that it didn't end up in a calendar, but it ended up on their wall and created a great friendship. Yeah, hell yeah. Um, Farhan, did uh did you ever meet any any other like um political prisoners or any people that pushed you along that path? And then also, how did you meet Josh? Two part question. <laughs> okay. I, I I believe when I was at Greenhaven, there was one uh, elder gentleman. Uh, and he was Muslim, and everybody's uh, general consensus was he was part of the Black Panther Party, right? And every time, like, even when he got drafted out, the way they draft him out, like, usually, as you know, when somebody getting drafted out, you know, day before, you pack up your property and then you leave, but they will just simply remove him from the cell and take him to the next facility, and his property will follow him. So I believe he was uh, part of Black Panther Party. Here and there, we will have conversation. The conversation was in that kind of direction, but he wasn't really uh, explicit to state that this is who I am and this is what you should be doing, uh, how you can understand what the government is doing and how you should be responding. I think what really helped me when I will interact with him or another couple of elder men who were close to him is that by, for me, since I was reading all, all this material from different perspectives, hearing from uh, him personally, it was kind of like a more eye-opening or reinforcement of that same narrative of what's going on. So for example, I read this book one time, uh, A Full Spectrum Resistance, is two volumes uh, by Eric McBay. And I believe anybody who's doing uh, advocate work or political work, he or she should be reading that book, right? Uh, so my interaction with him was really a reinforcement of that, how these oppressions are, oppression still exists in many different uh, cultures, many different settings, and how we should be educating ourselves to uh, be a better citizen where we can make better choices. Uh, answer to your second question, how I met Josh, right? <laughs> So uh, Hector and I, our time overlapped when we were in prison. Uh, we were in Greenhaven together, and then we were in Five Points, uh, I mean, in uh, Fishkill together as well. Uh, when we were at Fishkill, uh, right after when Hector submitted some of his work for the Southern Days calendar, and he came back with that note, he built his relationship with Josh. A couple of years later, he introduced me to uh, Hector introduced me to Josh and I began to communicate and then 
Josh asked me similar thing, like, look, we are about to do another process of selecting assets for the certain days calendar. Would you like to submit something? So in 2022, I did submit an essay, uh, which got selected for, uh, I believe, 2024 calendar or 23. Uh, this is, is so uh, not clear for me because of that 18 months being stuck in detention center. But that was how I met Josh and I'm great to have that opportunity because he really helped me uh, expand more on that understanding, like what is this political uh, understanding of uh, fighting uh, when it comes to industri prison industrial complex? Because it's one thing we can just fight it only on a social level, but it's very uh, expanding understanding when we see how social and political um, entities, they are so much intertwined that you cannot even separate them, but yet they are shaping how we are interacting in each, uh, in each uh, setting. So I believe more I'm reading in different books, individual fight or individual way to fight is really helping me to combine each of them together and acknowledge that we have to change our environment in order to change ourselves as well. We cannot simply just change our mindset and move forward. Uh, yeah. Oh, yeah. And for anyone watching, I say this almost every time we do this, but the more Josh Davidson's we have, the quicker we can tear down this system. Um, if we have people really I putting agree, in tangible work and tangible support and tangible love and really caring, that's how we win. So more Josh is the better. Um, so I would like now to talk about both of you participating in college programs, it seems. Um, I Lots of programs, really. And I would like to ask why, firstly, why do you think there's not more politicized prisons? Like we all experience this repression. Why do not more people come to that table of like seeing the systematic abuse and wanting to fight it? And then two, what role did you think having access to those classes played in your life to like push you on that direction? And Farhan, you go ahead and start. So I think the why we do not have enough political prisoner, I would say because a lot of us, uh, we lack uh, examples, we lack role models. We were not around in those kind of settings where we'll see what's going on and how we can fight. It's like, uh, for me, at least, like, uh, growing up in Pakistan, I was so, like, far away from the main narrative of what's going on, right? And if we not just, you know, like, if if you don't see a star around you who might be a better author or might be a uh, sports figure, if you don't see anybody, you don't see yourself being on that level. So mm -hmm. I think if we don't have the reason we don't have that many uh, political uh, uh, person coming from prison because they really didn't have that much experience being around somebody. Uh, and I think what really helped me in those classes that I was finding some of those examples through books. And sometimes I will see some professors, they had that uh, drive for that. They were working and they were doing abolitionist work. They were doing community level work. Uh, they were giving us examples how to see the world from other lens. Like as Hector mentioned earlier, uh, uh, Mindy Fuller Love Books Roots, right? Uh, she has written like few books in that uh, series after the Roots, right? Basically, is one of the things it shows uh, through gentrification process is that um, our built environment and how our uh, like social and environmental facts, they are intertwining, right? How each can impact the other and how we should be engaging with our immediate surroundings. Those were the things which were giving me a different lens. They were showing me how other professors are doing a similar kind of like abolition work from many different lens. So by seeing that, it gave me a, a whole different spectrum. Okay, I could be doing that work from this lens or from that lens. And those were the examples which helped me to 
expand my understanding or or pursue more of that uh, political uh, perspective. Awesome. And for those watching, this is why they ban books in prison. Because that access creates a uh, power and they don't want you to have that. Um, so, Bori, if you could answer the same questions, friend, about why why you think we don't see more politicized prisoners and the role having access to education or classes might have played in your your finding it or wait, what, however you want to call it. So I'm going to start from the education part first. Like you just said, right, education frees mind and opens mind. At least for me, it allowed me to view myself in places that prior to it, I didn't see myself, right? Like being in, in bar college, being among peers that I feel were way smarter than me, were better critical thinkers than, than myself, and seeing how they... Uh, um talked about the same material that was reading it allowed it encouraged me inspired me but it also allowed me to see myself as a scholar it allowed me to see myself differently than without an education and the system knows that right the system knows that also you have officers that have very limited um education and they don't, you know, they always say, well, why should these people have education where my children have to pay for it and so on and so forth, right? So there's always something going on kind of like to to um keep education away. But I think the main reason is because it opens your mind and it, it just allows you to become better in every way that you can, whether it's arguing, the way you view yourself, the way you view others. It just changed your whole life. And I don't think the system has an interest in changing your life in that manner. Why I don't think there's enough political prisoners, my opinion is that sadly, the way prison culture is, the different gangs, the different groups, they become oppressor, right? And so, like, one of something in one of Marion Cava's book, right, she said that we have to do this work from a place that is safe for us, right? So if you're going to do the, the, the abolishing work, you have to do it from a place that you feel safe and comfortable, right? And in prison, it's hard. In 1999, the whole New York State wanted to strike because they felt that if they don't go to program, they could get the laws changed. Which that doesn't work like that, right? The, the only way the law is going to change if legislators change the law. But you have a large population of people incarcerated. A lot of them are gang members. So now they're saying anybody who leaves the cell, we're going to cut them. We're going to do this. We're going to do that. So now they are becoming the oppressor and they are forcing other people to not do what they feel is correct, right? So that's one reason. Another thing is, we have to understand that people who serve in a long period of time, they find a certain stability in how to do their biz. A lot of them don't have support from families or friends. And so whether they work in an industry, the mess or wherever it is, the moment they get caught with any controversial information, whatever, they're going to lose those privileges. So they, they're going to go back to starve and all these other things. In 1999, with, with that riot that I was talking to you about, it was called the Y2K. Neighbors of mine, they the officers came, handcuffed them, and threw them down the stairs. Like You could hear them screaming as they being handcuffed and thrown down the stairs. So that is sending a message to everybody else there. And so that is why, right, is, is that I'm sure there's many other reasons and many different perspectives people may give you. I did it from a place that I felt was safe for me and I could still get my education and I could still reach out to people, right? I don't know if it's my character. I don't know what it is. I don't know if it was the universe. Again, I was lucky that I didn't allow for people to pressure me to do anything that I didn't want to do, but that's not the case with everybody, you know? And so that's, I think those are the reasons, you know, Messing with people's stability, uh, uh, family reunion. If you only see your wife and kids every forty-five days, 
you're going to really think twice about challenging a system that's going to take that away from you. And, and they know that. So Yeah. I, I think that's an amazing perspective for people that do abolitionist work to remember also is that by forcing our values or forcing people to act in a way that feels good for us, it might really jeopardize how they live their entire lives. Um, these bastards yeah. can take everything away. Um, so thank you for bringing that up as well. We only got a couple questions left. I've asked Liberty for, for a couple more minutes because I'm really enjoying this conversation. Um, something I would like to ask both of you. I, uh, I asked this to almost every panel also, and it's about the trauma, if any, you've experienced since being out and how you dealt with that. Um, everyone's bit is different. Everyone experiences different things inside, whether it's brutality, whether it's just repression, boredom, whatever. But we all go through it together. And so I'd like to know if, how's it going? Like, how has your release been? Have you, have you got help if you need it? Have you, have you found comfort in things? Just how has it been since being free? Um, and Farhan, we can start with you, friend. So uh, the way I look at it, uh, yeah, physically I'm released about more than three months ago. But I believe my mental healing is yet to start. Um, the way I'm looking at it, anybody who does more than a few months in any kind of place which traumatizes them, uh, they definitely need a long-term uh, healing process. Uh, the one way I'm doing it is, is, is a few different ways. One of them is uh, having a conversation with a psychiatrist, yes. trying to learn what are my triggers and how I can live with them, not to suppress them because the way I look at this uh, mental uh, thing is, is uh, imagine a heart has been broken. You can put those pieces together, but the scars are still there. So I cannot try to say, oh, I need to find a way how I can uh, remove those scars. What I need to do, I need to find a way how I can learn to live with them. So for example, what are my triggers? Like one of the triggers that even has been over three months, the moment I hear the sound of keys, it reminds me of prison, prison setting. Uh, so I need to learn what are my triggers and how I can live with them uh, in a way where they will not further stress me, further mentally uh, challenge me, rather than help me overcome with them. Other example is that I would like to talk to my friends who can relate to, who have gone through similar uh, experiences. Uh, my family, my wife, I will talk to them, share what's going on with me. So by sharing this with them and hearing their feedback helps me overcome some of the media stress. This whole program is that exact thing for me. Um, yeah. You said you get to talk to someone like a mental health professional. Is that something that gets provided to you? Do you have to pay that? Is it a weekly thing? Like, what is your routine with that? So for me, uh, uh, it's a weekly routine. Um, I got introduced to this person through one of the organizations. Uh, I do not have uh, Medicaid or uh, any kind of uh, proper Medicaid health yet. So this is through a mentorship program. I'm getting this opportunity. Brilliant. Prisoner support can save people's lives. Um, yeah. yeah. All right. Uh, friend, um, Bori. Yeah, for me, I've always wondered how trauma was going to show up for me because I've heard stories of people coming home and not wanting to be in crowded places. And I don't have a problem with being in crowded places or crossing the streets or anything like that. But I realized how trauma showed up with for me, when I came to Yale, and it took a while before I got my, my Yale ID, and I wouldn't go inside certain buildings. I would not go inside the art gallery. And um, and I told somebody that, right? And I told them, listen, I didn't go inside the art gallery because I didn't want to come in conflict with the security guard, right? And they told me, well, first of all, the only person they know you is formerly incarcerated is you. Second of all, you don't need an ID to go into these places, right? And if you go somewhere you're not supposed to go, most they're going to tell you is like, you know, what are you doing here or whatever? Like you're not going to get sent back to prison. And so I reflected on that. And I remember that one of the things that I did in prison was 
to not venture off to places that I felt would get me in trouble, right? And for example, if, if I live in a company, it's highly unlikely you're going to find me hanging out in another company, right? Just so that I didn't have to deal with the officers or none of, or anything like that. And so I realized that I was doing the same thing out here. And so once I became conscious of that, I said, you know what? I just got to keep pushing the envelope and I got to push myself into those places so that I could break, you know, that, that whole mentality. I don't go to a therapist, but I have so many mentors and friends that I talk about so many things that they serve as therapists. And I also, I think art has also helped me a lot. I doubt it has. Um, nah, I, I respect both of you so much for real. So this will be, this will be the last question and thank you Liberty for letting us push, uh, push that clock a little bit. Um, you've both done really well. Like you both, like you've gotten out and it seems like you're both doing well, like as far as like projects or tangible like success. So if there's anything like any projects you're working on that you would like to boost um, or any words that you would have like for people that do abolitionist work to help them understand like how to support prisoners better or both. Um, so you can go ahead, Lori, we'll just start with you and then we'll, we'll end with Farhan. I mean, projects that I'm working on is is I'm trying to, right now, the, the you know, I finished two art shows here at Yale. Tomorrow I'm going to Yonkers, New York to see some of my work at the Yonkers um, Riverfront Library from one of four. Um, and I'm having an art show at the University of New Haven in February and another art show at the Katona Village Public Library. Those are just projects that I'm working on. Um, but when it comes to abolition work, I would say, right, because I so co believe in, in, in Marion Cabo's quote, like you have to do it from a place that is safe for you. But also I believe in, in reform to abolish. I believe that we need to enhance the quality of the people who are incarcerated, the quality of life while we're educating them and we're hopefully getting them to a place where they could advocate for themselves, right? And so not to push our beliefs on somebody else, but let them figure things out with guidance, of course, because, you know, if you don't introduce a book and, and you don't talk about it, then you, you won't be able to get their their own perspective on it. Um, And that's about it, I think. Yeah, awesome. Awesome. And congratulations on your art success. That's really fucking badass. Um, also, I've never met a prisoner or ex-prisoner who didn't believe in let's make it better while we tear it down. This seems to be a, a white liberal idea that we can't reform while while crushing. Um, Farhan, my friend, what do you have going on? What projects are you working on, if any? Um, and what would you say to to people like to help them better understand prisoners or to better help push prisoner support forward? So uh, two things going on, one is immediate and other one is like in a near foreseeable future, I should say. Uh, I have put a program together uh, specifically uh, with a mental health in my mind. So the objective of the program is to provide safe space where participants can uh, evaluate their mental state of mind and walk away with some more tools which can help them. Uh, so whenever they do face my mental crisis, they will be able to uh, get themselves back on the line and seek professional help. Uh, that program is just literally got completed. I'm just looking for opportunities to run as a pilot program, see what else I can do to improve it. Uh, is one thing what we have on a piece of paper, another thing when we practice that. Uh, this a second part uh, answer to your question, uh, as Hector mentioned earlier, I strongly believe about the part of well-being when we are learning something and trying to help others. So that applies to uh, a lot of us who are already doing the abolitions work and who are planning on learning, that what can we do to help them, right? So one thing is that uh, get to know them more, like uh, how we can learn what's going on with them 
so we can give them some more uh, uh, comfortable space where they can grow more. So this program is kind of uh, addresses that kind of point. Like the way I'm looking at this mental health program is for the men who are already in prison or who are just stepping up. So if we can help them understand where they are and how they can seek help, I think we are putting them a couple of steps ahead of it with somebody who does not know what to do when they are facing these crises. Um, so I like to end every show by encouraging people to please, please, please write prisoners. Um, this program wouldn't be happening right now if Josh hadn't written me or wrote me and then wrote these two comrades. Um, I always encourage people to write those in ADX who have nothing, um, 24 hours locked down every single day of their lives. Please, please don't forget those. And please don't prioritize political prisoners over just prisoners. We all need to be free and we all need love and support. So um, for real, thank you both so much. It was a real, a real blessing to meet both of you. And thank you for sharing your stories. Um, Josh, if you want to sign off and then Liberty, thank you, dude. Yeah, no, just thank you so much, Bori and Farhan, for joining us. It was such a pleasure. Hey, thanks, everyone. I appreciate you guys. It was fun for me. Yeah, hell yeah. So good to see you outside, too. <laughs> thank you. Thanks, all of y'all. This is a very generous um, conversation. I really appreciate you being here with us. Bye, friends. See you again okay, soon, Eric bye. and Josh. All right. Bye. Good night.